trauma. Everyone has it. No one talks about it. It seems easier to stay silent, ignore it, or stuff it than it does to honor it, learn from it, and finally heal. Trauma is debilitating, yet so often we suffer in silence. Trauma is not meant to be battled alone, and we are no longer going to suffer in silence. Together, we are creating a safe place to speak, to share our stories, and grow our strength as we heal. Together, we are giving a voice to those who have been silenced, bringing darkness into light and letting God use our stories. Today, we find ourselves again. We relight our spark and let it light up the world. Stop SIS is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating on issues of trauma and trafficking, as well as the amazing power of the healing journey. Welcome to Stop SIS. Hey, 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 big, big welcome back to Stop Suffering in Silence. This is the Stop SIS podcast, and my name is Denise Walsh. I am here with my co-host Rachel Timothy. That but it says Denise Walsh on your name. I don't know why that happened. Oh, because we were logged in at the retreat. That's why. Oh, okay. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Good so if you listen to the last episode, you got to hear from us and three of the survivors who were present about their story and just their experience in 90 day U-turn and at the Dream Life Adventure. And I have to tell you, like we are so proud of them. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun to hang out in real life, to hug, to connect in just a way you can't do over Zoom. In fact, Rachel and I wore our Stop Sis t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, super <laughs> cute. Everybody got one of those at the retreat and yeah, it was just a really magical experience. So thanks again to everybody who supported it. And if you make a donation today for Stop Sis, then it will go towards the next cohort. And all of that is so helpful because it helps us to plan, to know how many people we can have, where we can go. And, and so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Rachel, before we dive into today's topic, is there anything you want to add about the retreat or anything that you want to say? Uh, huge thank yous just because when I hear the stories of the transformation that these girls experienced, it uh, it brings tears to my eyes because, I mean, the darkness that they were in when they started our 90-day U-turn and they went through the program and you could see a huge shift, but then they came to that retreat still nervous, still unsure of themselves, and then by the end, they didn't want to leave. We had some who were in tears about leaving and talking about how do we stay in touch It's the community. It really, like our content is important, but the community is what is so amazing. Yeah. It's not like a three month, see you later, goodbye experience. Like we're in this journey now together and there is a text message group happening. They're supporting each other and it's out, you know, it's not just us adding value. Everybody's adding value. And it's really special. In fact, one of the girls texted me yesterday and she said, I listened to the podcast and I can't, she's like, I can't believe that's me. She thought, Ooh, who is this girl? Like she's on it. And then she realized it was herself. And I think that's just another example of the confidence that's coming from the growth that they're experiencing, but then also to have the opportunity to share their story, which again, builds confidence. And I mean, we all know that giving back is a huge part of kind of the grief process. And so they're able to give back to Stopsis by sharing their story and being a graduate now. And then when they participate in the programs in the future, they're going to just continue to be able to add value to the survivor community. So it, it's, you're right. It's not just a program, it's a community. And it's, this is just the beginning because we've got a lot of really fun ideas brewing yeah. and yeah, we're not done. We're just getting started. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into today's content. So today's conversation is a fascinating one because Rachel has shared with me things that people have told her at, at, at you know, emergency rooms, um, doctor's offices, even therapy offices, friendships, churches, 
that sting a little, um, that really aren't helpful on the healing journey. If that's the polite way to put it, are just like basically rude and not helpful. And so we thought we would have a conversation about some of the things that she's heard that are just good things to avoid when you're talking to a trauma survivor. And so I'm going to start with one. I've got a few on my list and then we'll have a good conversation about it. I'm sure this is probably one that you hear the most, and that is just get over it and choose to be happy. Like, are you done now? Time to be happy. Go ahead. <laughs> tell, tell us a bit about that statement and what it means to you. Well, no, because staying where I am is so much fun and living in this pain is just the best. And so I'm choosing to be miserable. No, like nobody does that. And so making that comment actually puts shame and blame on the survivor um, instead of being helpful. Like I get it. Everybody wants the survivor to feel better. They want the trauma survivor to get their like life back and get back on track. But by saying to them, okay, you know, time's up, you know, you've, you've had your time of mourning, your struggle, now it's time to get going. You know, you really can't decide that for a survivor that has to be decided within themselves and hearing those statements will put them back in the darkness even further, in my opinion. What I find when I hear that statement too, especially if they don't, if somebody doesn't know you all that well and they don't know your story and they don't quite know the darkness, it feels like easy for you to say, or yeah. do you even know who I am? Like, how can you know who I am if you don't know what I've experienced or been through? So right. it feels just like a surfacy kind of comment. Yeah, it's a, let's make this easy. Let's brush this under the rug. Let's make it easy for both of us because you don't need to feel it. I don't want to feel it. Let's just move forward and have fun. Choose joy. <laughs> That's, that is, that is, I, I think probably what it's about. Is yeah. That it feels too tricky for that person. It's uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. So, but I know we also don't want to stay in the pain. I mean, we've had a lot of conversations right. about that where there's seasons for grief and mourning and then getting your emotions out and working through it. We don't want to live there. And so we do need to decide sometimes to like, all right, today I'm a mom and I'm not even going to, you know, whatever it is. But I'll share with you some things that I do in order to help people make that flip. And you can see, I guess, what's worked for you in the past too, or what others have said that have worked for you. So when I am talking to somebody, and this could be a trauma survivor, this could be a coaching client. And all I hear is what's not working, the negative, the, the stickiness, the suckiness, the kind of like, you know, the hard stuff. I will let them share. And then eventually I'll say, so tell me what is working right now. I remember you doing that when I <laughs> and it would frustrate me, yeah. but it would pull me back out as well and force my brain to focus on the things that are going good. And I do believe there were probably times when I said to you, I don't know if there's anything going good right now. <laughs> and then what, and then we, you know, we're like, well, you've got four kids. Are they healthy? Yeah. Yes. Yep. <laughs> you live in, you know, and another one. So what is going well right now? And then the other one is tell me, this is a good one too. Tell me how you would have responded if this situation happened last year or five years from now, basically saying, how far have you already come? Because again, when we're during like experiencing emotion right now, or we're having a hard time, it's hard to notice how much growth we've already made. Mm -hmm. So another question to ask if you're wanting to pivot besides like, just be happy is tell me how far you've already come or tell me if you were to experience this situation three years ago, how would you have handled it? And I remember asking you that too. Yeah. Yeah. And it would help me notice, okay, I, you know, I am handling this better. I have come a long way. Um, and so I think you have to read the situation a little bit because there's a, there's a Christian song out there and I can't remember the name of it or probably even the right words, but it hits this point. 
if their house is on fire, you're not going to tell them everything's going to be okay. You're going to cry with them. You're going to hurt with them. You're going to feel with them and engage in that type of an environment for a little while so that they're not alone in the, in their house burning down, you know, the bleeding, you're not going to tell them everything's going to be okay when they're still bleeding type thing. Right. But if you know, they're far enough removed that maybe this has been a cycle. Maybe we're revisiting these negative thought patterns over and over again. Then you do start to use those positive truths of pulling them out, but don't, don't not allow them that time of grieving either allow because because that's not healthy right right no you're exactly right there is a sense of tell me what's happening what's mm -hmm. going on what did happen and allow the purging essentially of that story yeah because then they're going to feel like stuffing it as well and if you silence them they may not open up to anybody else again. It could be years down the road when they get brave enough to try again. So if somebody is opening up to you about a hurt that stings really bad in a person's life, honor that and feel honored by that because that's a big deal. It is a big deal. So after, so really these tools of what has worked right now, how far have you come are used after you've sat there for a little bit and maybe even not that first time, maybe it's used ongoing if, if things keep kind of popping up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because when you meet somebody for the first time and they hear you're hurt and their first comment is, you know, oh, it's not, a, it's not good to look at the past. You need to just look at the future. Well, that's not actually the case. You grow from looking at your past and choosing joy doesn't necessarily mean you're always happy. We've learned that it's actually super healthy to look back mm -hmm. in order to heal, not to, you know, ruminate, but to, to, to heal. So if we've got triggers today and we get these emotional upsets consistently, um, that's a sign that there's something in the past that's still kind of a thorn in our side that's still pre, you know, it's, it's that, uh, what did I call it? A, you know, a tether to the past. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we got to go back there so we can sort of start to revol resolve some of those situations right and be freed from them because there were times when you would think of a memory and it would create or, or a situation would happen or you know and it would create a ton of emotion and now a situation may happen and whereas three years ago it created emotion now you're you don't feel as it you can move through it faster is that true yeah, that's true. And I've even noticed like when a flashback will come and if I'm communicating with granny about it and she will say, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened. I'm so sorry you're having a flashback, like a comfort in a way of acknowledging and validating what I'm going through. But if I'm still in that spot tomorrow and still in that spot the next day, then she's going to kick me in the butt and say, all right, you need to start living like, yes, that sucks. But now let's, let's move forward. And so it, it's a time and a place for both things. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So another one that you've heard more specifically in the church, and again, like it shocks me, it just shocks me how quickly people are apt to use these words without change actually happening first, mm -hmm. without repentance, without change in behavior, without, you know, um, and that is just forgive. And I know you could talk for days on this one because you've experienced where uh, what we call wolves um, staying in a flock and just forgiving the wolf, but yet letting them stay there, they continue to hurt more people. And that's just not okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I, I could talk forever on this. Um, now I do know that when, when you forgive, it's not for the perpetrator, it's for your own peace. And maybe that's where these statements are coming from. Like, I just want you to have peace. And so just forgive and move on. But there's a healthy amount of anger and struggle that comes with a perpetrator in you. And so allow the person their journey of forgiveness. Uh, and I think God allows us that journey of forgiveness. He sees our heart. He knows our 
struggle with it and allow him that chance to work with me on my forgiveness. But in the meantime, then we need to be making sure the perpetrator is not offending again. And so don't focus so much on the forgiveness of the victim as much as you are focusing on the reoccurrence of the perpetrator hurting another victim. In right. my opinion. Well, and again, like I teach forgiveness, right? Like we know that forgiveness often is the thing that lets us kind of get out of bondage from, from the past. Yeah. But another word that we've learned to use instead of forgiveness, because that can feel like what that person did is okay. And that's not what forgiveness is at all. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is really just about you releasing. So another word that we've used in doing forgiveness work is releasing because that anger is the, I wish this were different. Why did this happen? You know, that's what keeps us living in the past in a way that's not helpful. And so re letting go or releasing some of that um, anger and frustration is a healthy step, but you're right. I think some people or some organizations or some, you know, we've seen them skip the part of like the perpetrator getting justice or changing their behavior or having a consequence. And they're like, Oh, everyone just needs to forgive now. It'll be fine. Right. And it's so much easier to forgive and release and surrender when you know that the community is going to handle it in the way that they're supposed to. But it, it's almost like the, the church has a tendency to go to the perpetrator and go to the victim and ask the perpetrator, you know, are you sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, he's sorry. All right, victim, now you need to forgive. Do you forgive? Well, no, I don't yet. Well, then the problem's with you. He's sorry, you need to forgive. And that's that's not how it works. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. So instead of saying, just forgive, what would be a more helpful thing to say? <laughs> um, Let's see. I, I think just ask questions. You know, don't don't give them all these. You, if you do this, you'll feel better. Ask them questions. Let them use their voice and see where they're at in their journey. You can speak truth and life without judgment and con condemnation. <laughs> what I found too, and I'm sure I can even get into this where it's like, here's the answer. And what I know is every, most people know the answer already. Right. <laughs> when we're sitting around and chatting, most people already know that it's helpful to forgive. They already know that it's not, they don't, they don't want to be living in the past either. Right. And so asking questions is a way for the conversation to evolve. And I think sometimes kind of putting our own this is what you should do, really shuts it down. It does. Because oftentimes trauma survivors are controlled. Their voice is controlled anyway. And so if they're hearing these words from you of you need to do this and you need to do that and not allowing the victim to share their feelings and what they think should happen, it silences them again. And there's been many times when granny has de-escalated me by simply asking questions. Okay, why do you feel this way? Why do you think you feel this way? You know, what is causing you to, to get to this point to where I end up coming to the same thing she could have told me to do in the first place, but instead I realize it myself by her giving me probing questions. And that's more healing on my behalf and gives me more control. Yeah, yeah, those are like guiding questions that can help you discover it yourself, which means you have that empowerment. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this is an interesting one. And I know your response to this has evolved over the years, but sometimes you have heard even from nurses, um, I mean, professionals and friends that, you know what, your story's too much for me. I think being around you is unsafe. Yeah, that last part. Uh, <laughs> oh, it takes my breath away a little bit. But what I know now and what I struggled with in the past is seeing the other person's perspective, all that they have going on in their life, 
um, what makes my story uncomfortable for them could be trauma from their own life, unresolved trauma, or um, just makes them more uncomfortable. Maybe they have some major things going on in their life that they cannot give my story the brain space right now. Whatever it is, used to in the past, I would put it on me and say something's wrong with me. Now I realize it's okay for people to not be able to listen to my story right now. That's not a reflection of, of me or my story or that I'm an inconvenience or a burden because that's what I've thought in the past. Now I know that, that that's okay. That's how God has planned it. They have other things they can do and other ministries they can be a part of. And I'm going to be just fine without it. And what I think is interesting to think about is at first, a lot of these statements may kind of derail someone mm -hmm. where, where they go, oh, I'm, you know, I wish I could just forgive, but I can't. And so I suck, you know, and just kind of take them through this. Now I'm worse off or I'm not good enough or, you know, I'll just pretend like everything's good and not tell you anything, you know? And so, yeah. and, and so I think there's, but as you grow, you could hear those same comments, but not be triggered in such a negative way. Have you noticed that? Yeah. It's like, I don't carry it anymore myself. I'm able to hear their words and acknowledge it for what it is and not put it on myself as uh, a burden. And that, I mean, that's just healing. I guess that just takes time and it takes, you know, I had granny pointing it out to me at times too. And having my eyes opened to that, there's a book out there that I probably mentioned it. It's called, it's not about me. <laughs> it was really good for me to read <laughs> because you see people's reactions to your story. It's not about me. You know, they've got their own story and that's, that's okay. That's how, that's how we're made. Right. What And when I think of Granny's connection with you, I could hear her sometimes saying, all right, Rachel, come on, choose happy, just forgive, let's go, time to move on, you know, but when she said it, it was not triggering necessarily, and I'd love to hear a bit more about why. Yeah, so she could say probably some of the things that would have hurt if somebody else would have said it, but I think the difference is she's always listened to my voice. She's always believed my words. That has never been an issue. As, but when you have somebody who doesn't know your story, who doesn't know where you're coming from or what the pain is like, or um, just is kind of wanting to shut you up, basically, you take that a lot different than you do somebody who's walked in the fire with you and has heard your voice for so long and cares and believes. Um, one thing that just keeps popping up in my mind is, you know, the power or no, the, the importance of our voice. It must not only be important to us, but important to God. Because when he created us, he didn't just give us his words in the Bible. He gives us prayer as well. So he wants us to use our voice even with him. And so a voice is important. It's part of being human. And when you take away somebody's voice, you take away their right of being human in a sense. Yeah. This is where the power of asking questions and just even sitting in the pain. Yes. Just giving someone a hug. You don't need to have all of the answers. You don't need to fix it right then and there. It really is just like, a, oh man, I'm so sorry. Yep. Exactly. Just acknowledging it. Another thing you've mentioned before is when people say, did it really happen like that? Are you sure? Is that really how you feel? Is that really what you think? Maybe you think this or feel this instead. Talk to me about that. Yes. So those are the exact things that a perpetrator does in a abusive relationship. They will, that's called gaslighting. It makes you question yourself. And so you've already been gaslit by the perpetrator. And then when you come out and you start speaking your truth and sharing your story and somebody's like, are you sure like, do you need, think this over again? Like, was it really him? Because he's such a good guy. You know, he goes to church. I've known him for years. Um, that is gaslighting. And you then make it to where the survivor is questioning 
their own memories, their own self. Um, and that's destructive in a, in a major way. Yeah. Cause that, I, I mean, one of the things granny has said to you that I just love <laughs> is when she said, trust your gut, trust your own instincts, trust yourself. Because I really think that's where in, all, our inner strength comes, trusting ourselves, trusting our God, trusting that intuition. And when we're, when we are confused or, you know, that's where we feel this out of alignment. And the more you trust yourself, the more in alignment you are, the more you believe what you say you're going to do. I mean, it's all connected, but yeah. But when somebody questions your story, then that can kind of throw you off kilter too. Exactly. And, you know, the definition for trafficking is you are either forced, coerced, or tricked into a life of slavery. Um, and trauma happens in that way often too. It's either force or coercion or fraud. But then when you come out and the people helping you are helping you in a forceful way, a coercive way, or a tricking, manipulative way, it doesn't give the survivor healing. It's just moving them to a different spot. And so give the victim a voice, give the survivor a voice, let them be in control of their life again. Yeah. Oh, I have a question for you and we didn't prepare this, so we'll see. <laughs> okay. But it reminds me of sometimes, you know, there's a balance between letting someone voice a concern or using their voice and then also kind of feeling like, oh, but I know best for you. Mm -hmm. And so the balance of saying, all right, I'm going to honor this request because you're using your voice. And I really, you know, I hear that. And then also let's push you a little bit outside your comfort zone to try something new, because I feel like this would be really good for you. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Oh, yes, I do. And I think it all boils down to your time with that survivor you know, if it's been short and you really don't know them that well, that's probably not the time to start pushing them yet. But, you know, for example, counselors and granny and my husband, you know, there was a point where I had to go away for safety and I ended up going to an eating disorder facility, but that was not something I wanted. And I fought it like crazy. Um, but I came to the realization of why before I actually went, but they had to push me in that direction to open my eyes to see why. And so it was, uh, it was one of those moments where it was not my control necessarily at that point, but it was what was best for me. Now there's also been times when it wasn't quite as much of a life or death type situation where granny's let me fall. And I think you have to sometimes let the survivor fall and pick themselves back up and try again, because that's how we learn. And that's what it's giving them control and a voice. Yeah. And there were some people at the retreat who were like, I don't know if I want to go for a hike, or I don't know if I want to go for the horseback ride. And I'm not quite sure. And so we navigated, all right, is this something where we say, all right, you get to come today. Mm -hmm. If you got to sit down, that's totally fine. Or nope stay home. It's okay. And it's tricky. It, it is. is. And I think the discernment is where you have to really dip into that discernment of asking God, what, what should I do in this situation yeah. before you act? Yeah. And we knew we were already stretching them to even mm -hmm. get there. So we didn't try to do that when we got there, but you would be surprised by once, once people got there and they felt comfortable they are again, again, a more able to stretch themselves even further than expected. Yeah. And there's been times when I've heard like from granny or whoever, you know, this is what I see. This is how, um, I think, you know, it would best benefit you, but it is your decision and I will be fine either way, but here's kind of like what I'm seeing now it's in your court. Yeah. And that's powerful. That's a great way to do it. Like a collaboration. Yes. Where here are some options, pros and cons of each. Mm -hmm. I know you feel like you want to do this, but let's think about this other option and then you can decide. Yeah. That's been really powerful for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, 
Okay, another one. This could be, and now this could be about the trauma itself, or it could be about, um, a, you know, continued conversations, but this is all in your head. Hmm. Oh, gracious. Yeah. And so it feels like once you voice that you are a trafficking survivor or a trauma survivor, even it's like the people view you differently. And that could partially be in my own here, I'm going to say it in my own head that um, I see them looking at me differently. But I know, for example, when I would go to hospitals after being hurt, there's a difference between when I said I am a trafficking victim. This happened as a result of being trafficked. I was treated differently psychologically than I was on the times when I went and I didn't voice that. And I just simply came in and said, here's my problem. And I think people tie a psychological aspect to it because they assume you're not mentally okay. And so there had been times when I would go into the doctor or in the hospital and I will explain a pain that I'm having and I will then be told maybe it's in my head because of my trafficking background instead of just validating the fact that, no, I, I hurt, I'm not okay. Um, whenever I was with a different um, safe house several years ago, there was one of the girls there who had, I don't even know what you would call it, honestly, but she went back in her brain to, she was probably 12 years old, but she, I mean, for days, could not get her out of that 12 year old spot. She didn't know anybody. She didn't recognize where she was. And when she was 12 years old was when she was trafficked. And so she was there and she, she thought anybody coming at her was gonna hurt her. And she was in fight or flight. We couldn't get her back to reality. So then we, they take her to the hospital to see you know, what to do. And the doctor's response is, well, maybe she's got a brain tumor or may, you know, like just not acknowledging what is actually going on. And they were going to put her in the mental hospital and, you know, give her drugs and hook her up. And instead the safe house said, nope, we're going to take her home and we're going to love on her and we're going to just be there for her. Um, and that to me is, is validating for the survivor. Can you imagine if when she would have come to, she was in a mental hospital instead of being surrounded by those who love her and were there for her? So it's, it's just, they get viewed differently based on where they come from. And, um, and that the comment of it's all in your head often comes to somebody who's, who's been trafficked. It's not fair. Well, what's, it, I, I, there's no words. I'm fascinating, interesting, something <laughs> to think about. I don't know. But um, as a former mental health clinician, if I were to go into the ER, because I was called to do you know, um, mental health checks on people and things, one would deem that psychosis. Okay. Versus deeming that um, a trauma response, which is truly what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and you're right. Like if somebody comes in and it's seemingly psychosis, you don't let them go home. Like you put them in the inpatient because they're not in reality right now. But what I'm, what, of course, we're learning is that it's a normal response to trauma. Yes. And the more that people know that, that it's not just psychosis, which it's, it's truly, um, you know, their brain trying to protect themselves. How did this lady, when she came back home and she was loved on, how did that process go? What did she really need rather so than inpatient? What was so cool to me was the one who was her granny, she couldn't recognize her, but you could tell she recognized her voice. Mm -hmm. And so anytime her granny would speak to her, she would calm down and it was like, she would start to contemplate, okay, where am I again? What's going on? But when her granny, I mean, her granny couldn't be there that whole time, those three, four days that all this was going on, she struggled then again with where am I, am I being hurt? But eventually she came back. She had no memory of those three, four days. And she was so thankful that she was in a safe place that entire time. 
Um, and so to me, that's just a great example of listening to the trauma survivor, even when she didn't have a voice necessarily, listening to the fact that she is traumatized, she's not mentally ill. Right. Because I can, my guess is, is that if she were in, were taken to inpatient, that would have added to her trauma. Oh yes, absolutely. Cause, oh, I, yeah, I can't even, I know. That. I know. And what, what I think is powerful is she was in a safe place with counselors, with people who cared. It wasn't like she was sent home with people that didn't understand what was happening. The safe house understood even more than the ER or someone who just met her for the first time. Right. Because they knew her before the switch or before that, um, like she went 12, as you say. And, and then she, anyway, they knew her better than a new person would. Right, exactly. And then I guess so listening to the voice of the advocates too is important. Yeah. yeah. You know, there was a time when um last fall when it was I had a situation where I was it was bad, but the people that I was with in my opinion when I was not able to use my voice should have reached out to Granny or one of my advocates to know what to do next instead of trying to navigate it on their own with their own thoughts. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Trusting the survivor and trusting the advocates because they've been on this journey longer. Yes. And every survivor is different, you know, but I feel like the number one thing in supporting a survivor, whether you've just met them or you've known them for a while, let them use their voice. Don't give them, you know, all of this advice. Just be there. Just be somebody in their life. Give them a little bit of normal. That's what I'm, I remember days when I just wanted normal. I wanted normal relationships. You know, I wanted to be able to do normal things. Give them a sense of normal. So tell me a story about somebody who did this right. Um, well, the, the safe house story for sure was somebody yeah. who did it right. Um, but So I can, there was a time when, here's another example, when I was going to be doing a speaking event at a church and um, somehow an officer that I have never met contacted the church and told them I am a scam artist. I am uh, not who I say I am. I'm just out for money and tried to get the whole thing shut down. Well, the church didn't really know me that well. They uh, were considering shutting it all down. Okay, let's look into this. Um, Well, there was one person who knew me well enough and was able to take my voice and take it to the next level and say to them, no, I know her. That's not who she is. And I, I believe her. I trust her. She's not mentally ill. She's not a scam artist. Like she transferred that to them and they trusted her enough to where the event was able to be followed through with. Um, but just having that confidence in me and standing up for a survivor like that is just an example of doing it in a right way, I think. Well, I had have to believe that when somebody stands up for you and has confidence in be- you and believes in you, that builds your inner strength too. Yeah. It helps me believe more in myself and my alignment of what the Holy Spirit's telling me to do. Right. Right. So let's say that, uh, cause we've actually heard several stories from people who now have this awareness mm-hmm. of what's happening in some communities and they've picked up on signs and stories from people and they've been able to say hey have you experienced this before you know they've started the conversation in their communities what are good options for people to say if they feel like they are meeting somebody or if they are meeting somebody who's been trafficked or has trauma in their past for example i know a friend who is listening to our podcast and read your book she was chit-chatting with somebody and picked up on what this girl was saying and plainly said, have you been trafficked? And then the girl, I'm I'm assuming she was shocked and said, yes. And so I don't know how the conversation went after that, but as people become more aware of this problem, what are some 
helpful things that they can do if they, when they meet somebody who has this experience. Yeah. I think one thing you just don't stop, don't give up. Um, I heard recently of a lady who had read my book, book, had heard me speak. And so she works at an ER and saw some signs from um, somebody who was brought in and she's like, something about this isn't adding up and it doesn't feel right. Whatever it was, I, I'm not sure, but she didn't stop being a voice for that girl and continued to push it to where people would look into that situation further. And when she got shut down, she pushed it again. She said, no, there's something wrong here. And because she did that, the police found out that that girl and one of her friends had been groomed and trafficked since the age of 10. And that nurse ended up bringing down a ring of three or four traffickers in their area. And these two girls, they were just like me. They went to school, they played sports, they were involved in all the normal activities. Nobody had any idea, but the nurse saw something and wouldn't let it go. Do you know what the nurse saw? She didn't tell me that part. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's the eye contact they struggle with, which you've got to, you've got to be mindful of, you know, is this a nervousness for a different reason or whatever. But when a child struggles communicating about something, they don't have words for something. Um, I don't know what it is that she saw, but it was enough to raise red flags and she didn't, you know, how sometimes we see red flags and then we say, oh, it's, it's probably not what I think it is. Right. She, she didn't even question it because if she had, these girls would still be in the life. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, uh, it brought me to tears to think eyes are being opened. Victims yeah. are being seen. Yes, and, and so I think if you are in a conversation with somebody and you know that they've experienced trauma or trafficking in the past, uh, letting them share their story, asking questions and being open. I mean, I think that's why our shirts say you are heard, mm -hmm. you know, because this is not a place to point fingers or to say you should do this instead, or you should feel this way or whatever. This is a space, a brave space, as we say, so people can share their story from their own experience. Yeah. And, and be validated I think for it. make sure you, you make it known to the survivor this is a safe place. I will not share anything that you tell me with anybody else. I will not judge you for your decisions. Um, I will not tell you, you should have done this and this different. Like this is your story to tell. And I simply want to, to be, to listen to you if you're willing to share. And I know when I began opening up about my story, I only gave bits and pieces and it was not forced out of me. I told it at my own pace when I was ready. And again, that gives the survivor back control. Well, and I think even when we met, I was like, all right, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you tell me about you first? Uh -huh. I, I think, think again, that's another point. Yes. I think I allowed you to talk a lot more at first because I needed to see if I could trust you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that space is created when there's a two-way street as well when, you know, you feel, um, you know, when you can be, we're both vulnerable, you're both opening up a bit, you're both sharing. Right. I remember one lady, she wanted to kind of hear my story, but in order to start it, she said, let me tell you a little bit about me. And she went on to share about how she had been involved in trafficking work, like um, going into strip clubs and trying to uh, minister to some of those women and getting them in church and what that's been like. And, um, she told me all of this experience that she had and what she understood. And then it made it feel safer to then say words that maybe I wouldn't say to just anybody, you know, who yeah. wouldn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think all of this comes with discernment. It's all situational, of course. Um, but it gives some good ideas um, for what to say, what not to say. And it seems like the biggest, you know, the thing is to not just shut someone down, yeah. but to truly offer a place to listen and be, um, you know, be in that grief for a season 
before we say, all right, time to move on. Yep. Make sure they know they are heard. One thing you've said that I think is very cool is that if you got shut down, you know, you went to somebody and they did kind of keep shutting you down. You didn't stop. You moved on and you tried and talked to talk to several people along the way before you found granny. And I think that's just another reminder that to everybody out there that you will find someone that you like, know, and trust. You will find a community that supports you, whether it's with Stop Sis or another community out there. So don't keep, don't stop advocating for yourself um, just because someone in their world doesn't quite understand. Yes. And I, it would take time in between each one. Like I would put that on myself for a while before I would feel confident and confidence, probably not the right word, but before I would be desperate enough to reach out to another person and hope that it would turn out different. Um, and I think when you aren't careful with your words and giving a victim a voice, know that it's going to keep them from wanting to reach out again. And some people won't have the strength to reach out again. So empower them to use their voice. Um, and then those of you who feel like you've been shut down time and time again, you've never been believed, you've never been heard, and you feel like there's really no point anymore, that your voice just doesn't matter. I'm telling you, it does. And there are, just like Denise said, people who want to hear you, want to hear your story, hear your words, and that you do matter. Absolutely. One of the cool things we're brewing is a survivor book um, where each survivor will have a chapter. And so those going through 90 day U-turn will have an opportunity to be a part of this book next year, because we believe that these stories do matter. And so we're supporting, not just speaking the stories, but writing it out for those that desire to say, this is what happened to me. This is how I worked through it. I mean, of course, it's a never ending journey. We're not like arrived by any means, but I think it's such a powerful part of the healing process. So all right. Anything else you want to add before we end with our I declare? Oh, first of all, thank you for letting me have a voice here. And, and I don't know if I, you've maybe said this before, but I it's hard for me to have a voice in most platforms because of you know my past and just being mindful of safety reasons. But giving me a voice here is super empowering for me. So thank you for that. Of course. Amen. <laughs> All right, you guys, um, if you are interested in the next round of 90 day U turn, please look in the description box. There's an email stop sis at protonmail.com. You can email or you can sign up for the waiting list. We are doing an informational call coming up here that we'd love to invite you to. So be sure to stay connected with us if you are a survivor and you want to be a part of the community as well. And if you're looking to support a survivor, to sponsor a survivor, then go to the GoFundMe in the description. We're building our website right now, which is going to have all the you know, more techie things. Um, but we love and appreciate your support. This, you are what is making this possible. So thank you so, so much. All right. I'm going to end with our, I declare, I declare Ephesians 320 over my life. God is doing exceedingly abundantly above all I ask or think because I honor him. His blessings chase me down and overtake me. I, I am in the right place at the right time. People go out of their way to be good to me. I am surrounded by God's favor. This is my declaration. And this is my declaration for you. Have an awesome, awesome day, you guys. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to this powerful episode of Stop Suffering in Silence. If you are interested in booking Rachel to speak at your school, your church, or on your podcast, then please email openblindeyes at protonmail.com. If you are interested in sponsoring a survivor on their healing journey and would like to donate to Stop Sis, then please check out the link in the description box or show notes below, or you can email stopsis at protonmail.com.
And finally, if you are currently suffering in silence or you know somebody who is, whether they're dealing with a current trauma or one from the past, then we will always recommend that you reach out to your local resources and find a counselor that you can trust because nobody is meant to suffer alone. Have an amazing week and thank you for being here.